Thank you for joining us for another US-China Institute webinar. We are so fortunate today to have with us Gary Reichel, the head, the founder of Qiming Venture. And we'll be talking with him today about innovation. Before we jump into the topic, however, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Two items. First of all, we are delighted that you folks are with us. Uh, we really welcome you to join in the discussion. And the way to do that is to go to the bottom of your screen and you'll pop up a little button that will says Q&A, type in your question, and we will try to add as many questions as is possible. So that is our strategy for today's presentation. So please take advantage of that and join the conversation. I see that we've already got one question. I anticipate many, many more over the next uh, few minutes throughout the, the course of today's conversation. The second item of business that I need to cover is that we hope you'll join us one week from today. Uh, so on Thursday, May 28th, we're going to be speaking with USC professor Nicholas Call. Nicholas is one of the foremost scholars in the field of public diplomacy, and he is going to be looking at national leadership and national reputation in the age of COVID-19. So he'll be focusing in on how the United States, how China appear to others. What is our image in the world? What influence do we have? Uh, are we gaining influence? Are we losing influence? Join us next week for that discussion. But right now we're focusing on a gigantic issue, the issue of innovation. Now innovation is key, of course, right? Uh, it's essential to economic development. It's essential to national security. People are quite focused on it. We need innovation to address everyday challenges as well as some of the big issues that loom before us. Innovation lets us speed up production, lets us improve production, uh, makes it safer, can remove tedious or dangerous tasks, that sort of thing. Innovative products, innovative, innovative processes, innovative services. These are all so essential, helping us to save energy in production, doing less harm to the environment. We need innovation to address the harm that we have already inflicted on the environment. So both governments in the United States and in China are fixated on innovation. Uh, in the United States, President Trump entrusted the Office of American Innovation to his son-in-law, to Jared Kushner, and pushed forward on that. If you're in China, you see the word innovation, Chuangxin, literally everywhere. Uh, it's on billboards, it's in the media, it's in education, and it's very much going to be in the news over the next uh, week as China's big political meetings are underway in Beijing. Now today, we are so lucky at USC to have with us Gary Reichel. Gary, as I mentioned, is the founding managing partner of Qiming. And Qiming is a remarkable firm. It's been involved with some of the highest profile uh, startups in China and is involved in some really interesting sectors of the Chinese economy, biotech, uh, you know, various medical devices, but also uh, the internet uh, in the sense of mobile handsets, connectivity, uh, they're involved with drones, they're involved with so many different things. Uh, Gary has been working in this space for a long time. Uh, he was a biology major at Reed College, graduated, went to work in Silicon Valley, earned an MBA, wound up helping Intel and Cisco operate internationally, ended up uh, living and working in Japan for five years, uh, becoming part of SoftBank, serving on SoftBank's board, and dedicated, create, you know, he's relentlessly uh, curious, creative, and a devoted father, he winds up in Shanghai. Now we'll maybe explore that a little bit, but that was 
more than 10, 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago, and he creates Qiming partners. And so those of you who have wanted to get a Xiaomi phone, Qiming was involved with that. Those of you who have, uh, those of you who are in China right now and have been surviving on delivery food, you've relied on uh, Meituan Dianping. Uh, others are very much the beneficiary of some of the biomed research that has been going on. But ladies and gentlemen, I can't think of a better person to be with us to talk about the importance of innovation, some of the challenges that you know, companies have, venture capitalists have in finding viable, uh, you know, creative entrepreneurs and, and backing them, the kind of things that the venture capitalists can provide to the entrepreneur, how you take a company public, these kinds of things. But also we have a remarkable opportunity to focus on China specific questions uh, because that's the realm that Gary has operated in and operated hugely successfully. So I wish we could all clap, uh, but for now, let me just be the one that says, Gary, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, my pleasure, Clay. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, <clears throat> innovation is critical, right? And we should probably back up a step because what is innovation? Uh, maybe you could talk with us a little bit just about you know, innovation. We all have some sense of how things, how things have changed. And you've been part of bringing about that change with Intel, with Cisco, with SoftBank, with Chimi. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how you find and nurture innovation. Mm. So it's an interesting definitional you know, question when you talk about innovation, because a lot of people think about innovation and say, well, the microprocessor was innovative. Well, there's a difference to me between an invention and innovation. So the microprocessor was an invention. The internal combustion engine was an invention. And then you have innovation around that. So the way to think about it is you have an invention occur. And then what people do is they'll do trial and error on improvements around that. And that's where the vast majority of innovation occurs in the world. That happens to be something the Chinese have proven themselves very adept at. The idea that you put something into the market and you have a very, very uh, you know, quick cycle time, just this relentless, okay, make it better, take it back, make it better, take it back. And then at some point, a step function occurs and you really do get a more, what, what you'd have as a more profound uh, you know, innovation. The iPhone, cell phones existed. The iPhone was clearly, you know, it was not an invention, but it was clearly a major innovation. So there's, you, you have a both incremental innovation and you have step functions, step function innovations. The vast majority of things that a VC invests in, wind, we think they're step function innovations. The vast majority, if you're lucky, wind up being incremental. And so what you hope for is you hope for something that breaks through and creates a brand new product category. But generally what you wind up is you wind up settling for things that make something 20, 30, 50%, 200% better. But every once in a while you run into someone who has simply a fundamentally different way of thinking about a sector. And when you hit those, those are, those are out of proportion returns, you know, from the, from the VC perspective, China has actually gone through a very, you know, it's gone through multiple stages. Everyone on this has probably is very familiar with China. So things are have happened there in a very compressed time frame. So they've had really 20, 15 years actually of institutional venture capital. The US has had 50. But you reach the point where in the last couple of years, China and the US started to become you know virtually peers in terms of the amount of venture capital, uh, the amount of startups that were being created. Uh, the number of companies that reached a billion dollar, the unicorn valuation numbers, IPOs. So those, there's been a convergence between those two markets that's been quite dramatic in the last 15 years since uh, Qi Ming was founded. Yeah, so you highlighted uh, this difference between invention, the, the creation of something really distinct, and innovation, and you highlighted uh, two kinds of innovation, right? Step innovation, uh, improvement on something that exists, and then 
this, uh, I'm sorry, the step innovation is this giant leap mm. where you create something totally new. And I wonder if you could focus uh, in a little bit more. You just mentioned that China, because you have such a fierce competition, everybody's moving to make these incremental improvements and they need to, to hold on to and expand market share. Can you say something about how uh, you've identified the, the amount of venture capital as about the same between the United States and China, but is, does the venture capital uh, operate differently in the two places? Mm -hmm. And how has Chinese innovation thus far differed from the innovation that we see elsewhere? So if you go back to the, the time that I'm mostly familiar with the last 20 years, what you had in that first really 10 year period of time, 2000 to 2010, is you had the Chinese engineers that were in Silicon Valley going back to China, the Chinese biotech researchers that were in labs in New Jersey going back to China. And so they had some sense of what was happening in the US and they would adapt that to China. So there was a and the, lo the localization process, almost by definition, is, a, is an incremental process. So what happened is a lot of people, even in the mid-2000s, were saying, well, China can't innovate. It's just copying what the U.S. does. That was, that was probably, I, I, I never thought it was a fair comment, but one could make a case. So then what started to happen around 2010 is you started to see things happen in China that never happened in the U.S., so the entire payment infrastructure that Alibaba and Tencent put in place, nothing, nothing had ever operated at that scale or in that kind of system in the United States. Um, you started to see more and more companies have really complete teams when they were starting the, starting the firm as opposed to just finding a great CEO. Um, you had, in 2005, you had one unique compound in the pharmaceutical industry, one unique new novel compound approved in China. Um, last year you had about, or 2018, you had about 400. So really profound changes in terms of the kind of uh, products that were coming into the market. You still have not seen a great deal of invention. So that's where, and, there, and part of the reason is, everyone in China is in a hurry. And for the last 20 years, everyone's been in a hurry to make money. So when you look at inventing something, you're looking at inventing something and maybe it's three years, five years, 10 years, and there's a, a significant chance of failure. So that has not attracted as much energy or attention. And the Chinese government actually, by giving so much money to the state-owned enterprises, that has not been productive capital. That's not, that's not where the real inventions are gonna be coming from. It's, they're gonna be coming from the private sector, in my, my, my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> That, that has lagged a little bit, but I think now what you're seeing with in the pharmaceutical industry, cell therapies, gene therapies, you're seeing the Chinese researchers at the very cutting edge of some of these areas. AI, there's no question that with given the amount of data that the Chinese have to work with, the AI work that they're doing at the very cutting edge, um, image processing, surveillance, for better or for worse, at the very cutting. So, so you're seeing things that really are invention oriented now that are starting to come out of the, come out of that system. But, and it's, it's happened, at least to me, some people would say, well, it took a long time. I actually think this has happened incredibly quickly. Um, when it happens within a 15 year period of time, it's, it's extraordinary. Well, and you, uh, you came out of Silicon Valley and, you know, were involved with these giant uh, tech firms, Intel, Cisco, that sort of thing, they, they, they grew you know, fantastically large. So you saw something of how a company can invest in the sort of research and development over the long term to bring about those kinds of changes. I was wondering if you could, and, and certainly Chinese state-owned enterprises have had the resources, but haven't produced the goods. Uh, we, we haven't seen the innovation that we see in the private sector in the state sector. So maybe you could say something about, you know, building uh, companies that 
invest in their own, developing their own intellectual property, not just in securing market share, but in transforming products and services. Right, a good example, um, con uh, controversial example is Huawei. So Huawei was launched late 80s, 1990 timeframe. You never talked about Huawei being an innovative company for 20 years. And, but then suddenly- and you were involved with Cisco, so you were hyper aware right. of that. Yes, and, and, and so, but then by 2005, 2006, they settled all their lawsuits. And, and then what you started to see was that they actually had switching equipment that was every bit as capable. Um, the Nokia, the Ericsson's, you know, anyone loosen anyone in that market, and so they actually. But but it's interesting because it took them 15 years, and they were good. It took them 15 years to actually develop that capability. Um, consultants at IBM in 2002 and three and four were the ones that taught Huawei how to develop software. So so they had a lot of help. But it, but it still took 15 years. Startups, the venture capital community, we, don't, we typically don't invest in, if you say, well, you're gonna have a success in 15 years, that's not terribly interesting. So the VC world forces timeframes on entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Now the good thing is entrepreneurs exist only to solve problems. They can try mm -hmm. to solve a big problem, they can try to solve a small problem. That's why in this environment now with COVID, there, it's actually a perfect environment. I think the next five to 10 years, we'll see extraordinary investments and extraordinary results coming out of the venture capital industry. But China kind of walk, kind of slow walked its way into that. Before 2005, there was $1 billion available for risk capital in China's venture capital industry. In 2018, there was 40 something billion dollars. So dramatic change. And the other thing that happened was there was no RMB risk capital in the early phases of that. So what a lot of people don't, they think, well, the, all that money came from China, really about 80% of the risk capital that really went into truly innovative startups from 2000 or 1998 to 2018, about 80% of that money came from overseas. It's only in the last few years that the RMB, the domestic currency, has developed an appetite for that kind of early stage risk. And now that's now it's filling in, so it's it's becoming it's becoming much more of an available pool for early stage risk capital. But so there's again you've seen a lot of a lot of transitions along the way. So Huawei is one example. I think that what what Tencent and Alibaba have done with payments mm -hmm. is really extraordinary. Um, and what underpinned payments was the creation of something that's very unusual in China, which is trust. Um, to me, China's always been a very low trust society. So in 2003, if I told you, you're going to go online, you're going to buy a product you've never seen from someone you don't know, give them your payment information, and someone's going to drop a packet, I would have said you're crazy. That's just not going to happen. What Alibaba was able to do is by guaranteeing a level of service for delivery and pickup and payment, they were able to create trust. And when you look at company, you look at the most valuable companies in the world, they were able to create trust. And that allowed them to then get into payments. And the Chinese government is very interesting. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling around, but another, another very interesting aspect of discussing innovation with Americans about China is they say, well, it, they just do what the government tells them to do. No. So the government in 2010 let Alibaba and Tencent launch their payment you know, applications. Within seven years, 90% of the new account formation in China was in those two companies, not in the banks. The Chinese government did not intend for that to happen. But it was again, I trust you to buy a product, I'm gonna trust you to do banking. Oh, turns out I can actually trust you with my money. And then the growth was just, you know, just exponential from that point forward. So that is right on the cusp of, with that. was that an invention or was that an innovation? And so you can start to look at some of those services coming out of those Chinese companies, and they really never existed anywhere at that scale in the world before. Yeah, uh, financial technology is probably, you know, really one of the giant stories of the 21st century. As you said, uh, Alibaba and Tencent, you know, they didn't have permission to become banks, 
but they no. leapfrog the banking companies, they leapfrog the credit card, and they are now providing all of this payment service and facilitating the emergence of this giant consumer driven society. Uh, you know, that technology is very much a part of that. Now, Gary, you one mentioned- thing, One thing I, let me add one more thing, because if you look at what's the biggest single threat, if you ask someone what's the biggest single threat today in terms of what the U.S. faces with China, and it's actually something that people in the States don't have enough visibility into yet. What China is doing now is a four city trial on a right. cryptocurrency. What that does is it allows China to create the equivalent of a sovereign trading currency without having to open up its capital account. That is interesting. And that's something I was on a call this morning with folks in DC. They are, I mean, they, they finally woke up to what that actually means. And the first countries that get involved in that, there will be a mass amount of innovation. I mean, China may not be doing it. I mean, usually you do crypto for transparency and that's not quite where the Chinese are going to go with this. But nonetheless, if they successfully get a trading account currency set up um, in, that, in that framework, it'll be a phenomenal challenge to the, clear, the uh, trade clearing accounts in, in uh, euros or uh, dollars. Well, and also, as I understand it, that particular, you know, the, the creation of this new digital currency is also to give uh, the People's Bank of China and the Chinese government a better window into credit issuance and a lot of other things uh, that they would like to be able to monitor and have a better idea about. Uh, sure. So it, 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 it has all sorts of, all sorts of functions. Now, Gary, you, you said, uh, that entrepreneurs are problem solvers. Uh, they, they find a problem and hammer away at it. Now you've worked with you know, some of the greatest and maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you identify uh, the people, you know, how you separate the people who might be able to talk a good game and the people with both a clever idea, the drive, the organizational skills, the you know, interpersonal ability to work with others uh, that you have seen in action, people who can deliver. So there, there are many attributes, obviously, of successful entrepreneurs. A really relentless curiosity is right at the top in terms of what I look for with people, especially if you're going to do something incremental then the odds are you already understand a fair amount about what it is you're trying to do. If you're going to do something that's a step function or something that's never been done before, you better be curious because you, by definition, you're not going to know a lot of the things you need to know to ultimately be successful. Uh, Lei Jun from Xiaomi has that, has that characteristic. Ma has that from Alibaba and Ma from Tencent. They both have that characteristic. Um, so, what you, do, what you realize is when they're pitching you on a deal, a really good entrepreneur at the end, you've both spoken for about the same amount of time because they're not taking your answer or just answering your question. They're responding with a series of questions that cause you to think, oh, why do I really believe that? And they challenge you that way. Um, the other thing is, for me, this is a very personal one. Don't make me play 20 questions. So if I'm, if there's a problem or if there's something that you don't know, say you don't know, don't, don't avoid it or don't give me exactly the, the Chinese entrepreneurs and the, you know, even now they're really good at, well, this, you only asked this. So I told you exactly that, even though you know full well what I was trying to get at and you just chose not to do that. So the good thing is if you're curious, if, if someone has a meeting with me and they don't have any questions, they're lazy because they should have some questions, not because I know so much, but I know a lot of different people and I've worked in a lot of organizations. So someone should have done a little bit of homework. So that's what you, that's what you want to find in an entrepreneur that you're, that you're going to get excited about. Well, and your last statement leads to this question, which is as a venture capitalist, uh, obviously, people are talking to you, eager for your investment, but you're able to give much more. And presumably, those are the kinds of questions that you know entrepreneurs that interest you would be asking. 
what does a venture capital firm, yours or others, uh, have the ability to do, have the ability to help with? Mm. So a, a good example, in the early days of Chi Ming, my partner, William Hu, and I invested in a company called Tiger Med. So it was back 2007 when China didn't really have a robust clinical trial process yet. So 95% of Tiger Med's revenue at the time came from them doing trials for generic pharmaceuticals that were being released in China. Uh, today, 90, virtually 100% comes from novel compounds. And what, we, what William and I did was after the investment is he realized that a large part of what the company needed to be successful was to have a more robust analytical capability and data management, because that was a large part of the trial, having a successful trial. So we found a company that they acquired, which made them suddenly the equivalent of what a quintiles was able to do in China in terms of the analytics, which attracted the multinational pharmaceutical firms. So that would be an example. Most of the time, the single biggest thing VCs do is they bring either board members or they bring uh, staff. So my partner, Nisa, has done a lot of recruiting for all of her healthcare companies. Uh, my partner, Dwayne, does the same thing on the IT and the tech companies. So I think the recruiting broadly is one that we typically do. Business development, um, particularly around channels. So we have people in Chi Ming that have particularly good relationships with Alibaba, some with Tencent, some with Baidu. So depending on what the company needs, that partner would then make the right introduction so that they get connected. So, so I think really, if you look at the HR side, the business development side, um, and then if there's a strategic need like a merger or acquisition, we should have enough broad view of the market that we can contribute to that. Yeah, with the example, the specific example that you gave uh, with regard to, you know, pharmaceutical development, right? Uh, being able to provide uh, the infrastructure so that they could carry out these trials, be able to uh, demonstrate the efficacy of their products and to do that sort of thing. And you highlighted the complete transformation, not just of your, the single company, but in fact, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, you mentioned something like 400 novel compounds that were, were brought into being last year. And so you're able to, you know, marry, uh, you know, resources to these specific needs. But it doesn't always work. Uh, some people have highlighted in China, you know, the, these giant bicycle graveyards, uh, right, where you can find Mobike and all the others, Ofo and the others, all of these bikes. And that was uh, obviously a venture capital funded drive to be a dominant player. So I'm, I'm curious uh, what, you know, what you see as how venture capital is is advancing, uh, you know, moving China's economy forward, fostering innovation, that sort of thing, and then some of the some of the growing pains associated with it. And of course, this is not unique to China. We see that here in the states as well. So the sad thing about the venture capital community is that the vast majority of VCs are just lemmings. So they see a parade and they just have to be part of the parade. And once, the, once there's a, which is why for me, I've never invested in a deal where I lost money because I was too late. I've invested, I've, I've lost a lot of money because I was too early. And that's just my personality. Sure. And because I don't like chasing, chasing things. The mobile bike example, the, the bike example is interesting. We're the only VC group, the, the mobile bike investors, is the only VC group in China to have made money on that investment. I hated that deal. I thought it was expensive. There were so many companies, and, and it turns out we were both right. We got in at the last round where you could really make money, and I was right that ultimately the whole thing would wind up imploding. So we got, we, I, I view that as having been very fortunate. Um, but most of the time, what you have to decide on, a v, on the VC side is, do you have the ability to look at the market and the pattern recognition so that you can see emerging patterns? Or are you gonna do things later so that you're gonna look at other people that are doing things early and then you follow? 
And we've architected Shimei, at least from my perspective, to try to be more on the lead as opposed to follow stage. So about 80% of the time, we're, the first, we're in the first group of investors, the first investor in the deal. Um, but that's really hard. And you lose, you're going to lose companies. So we, there's no question we'll have lost 20% or more of our, and it's actually the, the mortality rate has been lower thus far in China than it was in the US, but it's a false number because this crisis now is the first time you've really had an extended down period in China. So a lot of the companies that have, that have refused to die, there are a lot of zombies in China. And a lot of those, comp a lot of those zombie companies I think are now gonna wind up dying. So I think the mortality rate over time should normalize to something not too dissimilar from what Silicon Valley has had. But when you see the amount of money chasing these later stage deals, and you start to look at a sector in your portfolio and your pre your average entry price is two to 300 million. Well, that's well above the average market value of a lot of, of the vast majority of the public companies. So you, so you start to, you, you really start to realize that this just doesn't make sense. So the venture community generally, um, has not done a good job of having the discipline of not chase, not over chasing, if you will. And I think that uh, you know China's just as susceptible, if not more susceptible than most places to that. And has, uh, you've been at it now in China for quite some time, has that lemming character, and I understand you didn't specifically refer to uh, you know, venture capital in China, but venture capital generally, has that lemming character uh, become less of an issue? Have more people seen your success and the success of other early true venture investors and followed that? Tried to find well, new opportunities? Well, again, it goes back to your level of patience because the average holding period for us in a deal is seven, eight, nine years. And a lot of the, uh, certainly the RMB funds in the early days, you had a, th you had a three-year investment period or two-year investment period, and you had a five-year fund life. And that for, there was a very short window during which those timeframes made sense. You know, now we have 12-year fund lives with extensions. And so that takes a level of patience that not everyone in China has demonstrated over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. But I think that I think that that people are now starting to understand that is the business. So the firms are getting themselves organized that way. They're staffing to support uh, those kind of time frames. So there's a nice maturation occurring now in venture in China, but it 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 is going to have a reckoning now. Um, there is enough venture capital money in China to support the companies that people have invested in, not all of them. So you're going to have to be very selective about how you deploy capital into those deals. And I think from that perspective, this again, this is the first, there's a day of reckoning. And the first time you go through this is never pleasant, but this crisis is precipitating that. Yeah, it will, you know, obviously the, the questions we have, you know, at the end of this, uh, first of all, beginning with when is the end, right? When does it, when does uh, the health aspect of this uh, morph into more of a pure economic story. I want to remind the viewers, we have uh, quite a few people on the line that you can participate by going and clicking on the Q&A button and typing in your question. We have uh, a few questions now and we'll start to go to those in just a second. But if you'd like to participate, please do click on that Q&A button and type in your question. Gary, if we could shift gears just a little bit and look at how uh, you know, this lukewarm war that we have going on between China and the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the strangest kind of conflict. Uh, we are totally bound to each other. Uh, you know, we do huge business with each other. Uh, thousands of people travel in ordinary circumstances back and forth. Uh, we have, you know, close to 400,000 students from China living and learning here in the United States. Uh, entrepreneurs like you, uh, you lived in China for a long time, go back and forth all the time. Uh, at last count, maybe 75,000 Americans living and working in China. This is not 
uh, the Soviet US kind of Cold War. We are much more intertwined. Uh, but the rivalry has been ramping up. And I'm curious what you see coming out of that. Uh, in the first Cold War, that sparked investment in science and tech in you know, the Soviet Union in the United States. We got certain innovations out of it. Uh, but the lack of communication between China and the United States could really stifle things. What do you see on the horizon? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very frustrating time to be uh, interested in uh, the positive aspects of US-China relations um, in both countries. There are an awful lot of people who just really don't wanna have that conversation. Um, for me, I think it's very, I think it's very possible to be pro-America, pro-democracy, and not be against China. And I think that unfortunately we're in a situation where people say, well, you, you, you they make it black and white. And I don't think that's fair. Um, we have all sorts of problems in the United States. China has all sorts of problems. There are all sorts of things I don't like that happened in the China with the, with the Chinese government. So, but that's been true of almost every, I'm, I didn't like Japan, parts of Japan when I lived in Japan. So, when I when I look at what's happening on innovation, the I don't think it's possible to really decouple because you're not going to be a, people talk about well they'll have entirely parallel universes in tech, that's just not going to happen. So what you still have is you still have the standard bodies that are well, that are you know for 5G, uh, for a lot the approval of you know drugs and things. Those groups when we get past the politicization of a lot of the conversation, those groups still function. And I think that we need to focus on the fact that all the really interesting problems need both countries to work together, especially the grand, ge the grand scale geopolitical problems. Now, competition in AI, I'm not quite sure what that means. Does that mean you wanna have the first, you know, does, it, does it mean you wanna have a company that has a higher market cap than NVIDIA? Does it mean you want to have so so you get into when you when you ask someone oh the competition what exactly is the competition is it the competition for market cap for capital so so I think that there's a a lot of misunderstanding and so you're conflating a lot of things company to company competition happens all the time will continue to happen all the time academics compete for publication you compete for the Nobel prizes you compete for, so you compete. Countries compete, but you need to be very careful that the countries that the countries also understand that half of their job is to cooperate. If I if I contrast the U.S. and China right now, China clearly with COVID didn't disclose, in my opinion, what it could have or should have in the early days. But the coordination that it demonstrated on the back end was really quite remarkable. The U.S. the collaboration has been extraordinary among companies and coordination not so much so both these countries have great strengths and we should think about we should be playing to our strengths because if you're playing to you're, you're trying to hold someone else back that the u.s doesn't do that well that's never been the history of the united states the united states is a forward-looking optimistic optimism oriented place and i hate to see us lose that we're also very much a values-based system and I hate to see us not continue to reflect those values. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, if I'm gonna start to take some questions from uh, those that are coming in, but let me actually marry one of the questions that was asked uh, by Sam Leo uh, about asking, okay, we know you've been successful. Can you give us an example when you weren't successful? Uh, uh, you know, what, what happened there. But I'd like you to tie that, if you could, to the U.S.-China part of the story. Uh, you know, was it, you know, was that a factor in some way? Mm. So I have not had any significant failures tied to disruption between the U.S. and China. So I'll, I would just say that. But again, we typically have been investing in China for China. 
And so we've not been terribly trade dependent. Uh, Xi Ming doesn't do a lot of cross-border work. The U.S. fund invests in the U.S. The China funds invest in China. Um, in terms of losses, I, if you have a lot of time, I can fill up just about any <laughs> amount of time with things that didn't work. Um, when I was running SoftBank in 99 and 2000, the market was going crazy. Everything was up and to the right. We raised a, the 1990 fund was roughly $600 million. We raised it and deployed it in a matter of months. And within nine months, it was up 3x. That fund never will return capital. Because what I didn't understand was at that time, we didn't, I didn't have the maturity because I hadn't been in that situation before. I had these wonderful partners and these brilliant guys have gone on to study, to start all these different firms. But we were too collegial in the sense of letting people do what they wanted to do instead of having the discipline to say, you know, I really like you, but I hate this deal. Uh -huh. So when I went to Chi Ming, the learning was, you know, we can be collegial and we can still hate the deal. And so there was an edge associated with that within Chi Ming that we were able to bring into the culture um, starting in 2005 that I wouldn't necessarily have understood if I didn't go through an incredibly painful 2000 to 2003 timeframe. Yeah, so they, yes. they, you could forge that relationship uh, and that relationship can be important, healthy, and the key to potential success. But the deal itself may not work, is what you're, it, it, well, am I understanding well, that correctly? No, the deals, there's always a chance the deals aren't going to work. But I should know when one of my partners has 35 board seats, I should be able to say, Clay, no more board seats for you. No more deals for you. And again, we let that go on a little too long. It's not too dissimilar, I mean, also at SoftBank, you know, Masa is a somewhat unique individual. So when you, when you get close to that, um, it's always tempting to, it, you always have to remember, you're not Masa. And so it's a, you know, there they're definitely, they're definitely is also a learning curve. I work for John Chambers now, Larry Ellison, and so, so I've had a chance to work for some of these guys. And you have to remember, you're not them. <laughs> No, it's a, an important an important test. Now we have some very specific kinds of questions uh, asking for you, Gary, to, to to look into the future and say where do you see the big growth prospects? Uh, and one person asked specifically with regard to kind of lifestyle products and things like that. Where do you see the big opportunities uh, in five to ten years? Okay, I'll try to be relatively brief. So um, let's separate five years and later between the next five years. Um, I would not be looking to do a lot of travel related investments in the next you know, couple of years because I would agree that China will come back from travel. I just think you, it's, this is a, ch a case where you may wind up blowing a lot of money before you get to that point. Um, the things that are not gonna go away, so our healthcare practice in China, is incredibly active. So Chi Ming's back 100% to work. Um, we've closed nine deals since January. Um, so the, the and half, you know, five of those are healthcare deals. So that, that ecosystem in China is really firing on all cylinders. Um, I think the automation, things related to automated manufacturing. Um, there's also obviously with all the discussions around supply chain, supply chain relocations, there's a huge issue, you know, huge issue around, you know, how do you automate uh, the manufacturing process? Um, the software as a service has lagged in China to date, but we expect that that will also become, um, you know, a, have a dramatic growth. Because if you look at all the data that the consumer side companies generate, the existing systems in China are not capable of dealing with that. So you're going to have to re-host the systems that you have software as a service side should get a disproportionate you know, share of that. Um, AI, AI is going to get a lot of investment, but it's, there's a lot of money that's going to be lost in AI. Virtual reality, a lot of money will get lost in, lost in AI, lost in virtual reality. But there will be companies that will come out of that that will figure out, we have a solution for a very particular problem, and that problem will be big enough, the solution will be big enough such that they can become an out-of-scale you know, out company and then expand into other areas. So I think the selectivity on that has to be very high. Semiconductors are taking a great deal of getting a lot of attention now. I'm not sure I'm a fan 
on semiconductors because of the capital intensive nature. And at some point in the next several years, capital will get constrained. Right now, it doesn't appear as there, there's any constraint on capital, but I do believe that we'll, we will be headed to a capital constrained uh, you know, area. But broad based, if you picked one sector to just put money in and wake up in 10 years, it would be healthcare in China right now. Yeah, but it's a safe bet, obviously. Uh, people are concerned with their health uh, and their, you know, it's an aging population. People need these kinds of services. So we can definitely see that. Uh, Gary, I need to let you go. You've been very generous with your time. If you would entertain just one, one you know, sure. kind of collective question from the group, uh, and you've already answered that, A, you don't think decoupling is really possible, uh, let alone desirable, but where do you see opportunities for U.S.-China collaboration? Now, healthcare obviously could be that giant that giant opportunity. So the things that we're spending, this is, I do spend a fair amount of time on this particular you know, issue. So um, things related to the environment is a very big one. You know, the Chinese government fully understands the issues that they have with uh, the environment. Um, and I think there's a great deal of attention, both in the NGO ranks and in the government ranks. Um, so there's very good dialogue. A woman named Taya Smith from a uh, Climate Leadership Council is involved, in, in, and we were involved with the Rocky Mountain Institute going to China, Peggy Liu at JUICE, and so on. There's a lot of really, really bright people that are that are focused there, and I think there are a lot of bridges that will withstand, you know, the current uh, disruption uh, in that area. Um, I think if you look at some of the some of the electric vehicle areas, um, way too many electric vehicles companies in China, 100 and something vehicles making. But the autonomous vehicle area, I don't know of a single Chinese company that doesn't have operations in the U.S. or vice versa. And I think that that area also, the the story energy storage area, that area also there'll be a lot of there will be a lot of competition. But I also think there'll be significant areas of uh, collaboration uh, in in that area. You already talked about healthcare. I think at some point you're going to have to have quite a bit of cooperation to have a really truly global cryptocurrency. I think you know, the you know, things that require standards for trade, at some point, someone's going to have to take a step back and go, we can't do this ourselves. So, so, you, so I think you are going to continue to see that. It's just in the next six months before this election, don't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah, in the short, short term, it may not be an especially bright, uh, bright story, but let's hope that long term, others will be able to do as you have done find ways to you know, work together. Gary, thank you so much. I apologize uh, to, to folks who may not have gotten their questions answered. We have just a ton of people on the call, uh, people who are anxious to learn from you. And I just wanna say thank you, Gary, so much for being with us. My pleasure. So ladies and gentlemen, we're uh, going to close it off here. Uh, some of you didn't get your questions answered. Please go ahead and continue to post those, uh, and we will share those uh, with Gary separately. So please do continue to post. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. We hope that you're with us a week from now when we're going to be looking at the image and influence of the U.S. and China in the age of COVID-19. So Gary, thank you so much, and thanks to everybody who has taken time to join us today. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye.